Good evening, everyone. My name is Councilor Gary Crawford. <coughs> I'm the chair of the Budget Committee. We do have quorum. I'd like to call our meeting to order. Today's meeting is being held here at the Scarborough Civic Centre. Mem members of the public who are registered to speak are participating two ways, video conference. Uh, I think the majority of people here tonight are on video and in person. Uh, tonight's meeting is streaming live on YouTube and you can find the list of speakers for this session on toronto.ca slash council. And I do ask for patience. Uh, we have been experiencing a number of technical dif difficulties and, and please be uh, patient as we try to resolve them. <coughs> Although we are meeting in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. And we also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. First, order business, declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, seeing none. Um, this is a special meeting of the subcommittee of the budget committee, the larger committee. Councillor Thompson and Moise are with me, and uh, of course we have Deputy Mayor uh, McKelvey with us, and I believe Mayor Tory has also joined us, so welcome everyone. Um, the other committee is over in Etobicoke tonight, and they are having public deputations and presentations as we are here. Our subcommittee heard from public speakers earlier today at our 1.30 meeting. This is the last session to hear public speakers. City Clerk has posted the speakers list online at toronto.ca slash council. You can click on the speakers button if you want to see where you are in the list. <clears throat> For the public who are speaking, here is how our process works. Um, we have speakers here in the room and then online, as I mentioned. If you're online, the video conference host will activate your microphone and you can turn on your video if you would like. I'll call each name on the list in order and then you will have five minutes to speak to the budget committee, after which there could be some questions by a few of the committee members if possible if they want to. After that, stay online because, as I said, members will uh, have questions for you. After your speaking time, you can stay connected and listen and follow the rest of the meeting on YouTube. The clerk has also received a number of emails and communications from the public about the 2023 budgets. Those communications are being made available to members of on the CMP clerk's meeting portal. And I encourage, always can encourage the public to send their comments to the Budget Committee through the budget process by emailing buc at toronto.ca. This is the public's opportunity, an important opportunity for the, budget, the public to speak to uh, the Budget Committee and other members who are with us on the budget uh, 2023 operating capital budgets. Uh, we'll be making um, our final recommendations as a committee next week on the 24th. From there, our recommendations will be going to the Mayor and to City Council on February 14th. Let's start with the speakers. I'll name the first three, and then we'll work our way down every three. So again, I have to be a bit, bit patient with some of the people online. It takes a few seconds to uh, get them hooked up. First three speakers today are uh, Vitan Burkick, Michael Benetti, and Brittany Karen. Vitan? Okay. We're starting off. Vitan's not with us. We will circle back later. <coughs> Michael Benetti. Come on up, Michael. Just right up here. You may have to turn on the mic. I'm not sure. Again, you'll have five minutes and the potential of questions after. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for having this meeting tonight. Um, I just want to start off by saying that I understand the budget is not limitless and that there are a number of trade-offs that uh, have to be made. So I apologize uh, before I start complaining about some of it. But, um, you know, I, I do budgets myself and um, I understand that. Uh, that being said, I think the City of Toronto has been in an austerity budget uh, mood for far too long, basically since amalgamation. And it is really starting to show. Uh, for example, our roads are a mess and full of potholes everywhere. Uh, even worse if you're on a TTC bus going over those potholes. Uh, we have rotting infrastructure in our public parks that haven't been maintained probably since the 60s. Our streets are not plowed in a timely fashion anymore. Our boulevard grass here in Scarborough reaches knee height before it gets cut anymore. And um, most scary of all is our 911 system is buckling under the pressure 
uh, for the first time. I unfortunately had to use it a few weeks ago and was on hold for two minutes while someone next to me was unconscious. And that I did a little research into that and found out that this has been an issue far before COVID because our budgets are not providing enough money for our emergency services. And um, so basically, a lot of these issues are predating COVID and that COVID can't always be used as an excuse for what we're seeing right now. Um, one budget item I'm particularly concerned about is the TTC budget. While I like that additional constables are being um, placed on the system, um, I'm not happy about hearing service reductions such as subway service going down to every 10 minutes during certain off-peak periods and also increasing the uh, number of people that can be on a vehicle to over a standing load during off-peak periods. Um, you know, some of this was said to be because of ridership. However, our ridership is projected to be at about 392 million riders this year, uh, quite a bit above the 372 million during our darkest years of 1996 when we had the big budget cuts and the recession-related uh, ridership decline. And even during that time, the TTC maintained frequent subway service. Uh, having 10 minutes subway service kind of places us with those uh, much more worse performing systems in the American cities. And uh, no other transit system I know of in the area has uh, seated, above seated load standards for off-peak service. Uh, the majority of TTC riders are choice riders like myself. We choose to take the TTC. And reducing subway service and increasing crowding is not going to make me want to take the TTC. I don't feel like standing on a subway for 45 minutes and waiting potentially 20 minutes uh, for two transfers um, just to ride downtown and back. I'll probably take the car if that's the case. So the TTC budget, I feel, should have spearheaded innovating service to attract new markets to the system uh, to help fill the trains and buses uh, due to the fact that we don't have a lot of the downtown commuters yet. Um, ideas like rejigging service so that we uh, improve crosstown uh, services, uh, express services, so people can travel to places that right now they may not uh, want to take the TTC to because it takes too long. Uh, now onto the revenue side. I would like to see the City of Toronto use the powers it has to generate revenue from other avenues other than just property taxes. Um, I agree ideas like a sales tax are not necessarily a good idea, but something like a hotel tax, which was voted down before, I think is perfectly acceptable. Um, all of us have probably traveled to an American city and you've paid that hotel tax and probably not even noticed it. It's not going to stop people from visiting Toronto and we have to look at other revenue generating ideas in addition to our property taxes. In closing, uh, I grew up in a Toronto that was known as the city that works, and we were a very model city of its time. Uh, it's one of the reasons that it made me pursue a career in urban planning. But 25 years of austerity budgets and very little vision has made our city not much of a model anymore. My American relatives used to marvel when they came here at our roads and infrastructure and, and downtown area, and they don't do that anymore. They come here and mention how Toronto's starting to look a little bit like how their cities looked before they went into steep declines. And that's not a nice thing to hear. Uh, the building we are standing in today and other places like the CN Tower would not be built in today's Toronto, I don't think. We are too austere thinking and myopic to think big anymore in this city and want to spend money on anything. We are a global, very affluent city. We should start seeing budgets that return us to the city that works and dreams of making us that amazing forward-thinking city that we were before. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hold on. We may have some questions for you. Um, I just had a couple of questions. It's just um, you'd mentioned a few areas, uh, and I'll just uh, pinpoint emergency services that you you find that it's challenging the city. So you, you're aware in this budget and 911 operators, we actually have 20 new uh, 911 operators proposed for the budget. We have 200 paramedics, 200 firefighters, and 200 police uh, in, proposed in this budget. For yes, I saw that. And okay. I'm very happy to hear that. I just find it concerning that. This was years in the making, and now we're finally addressing it now when we knew this was happening before the pandemic. Okay. And you mentioned, too, when you're looking at revenue, too, is we actually do have a hotel tax. We're actually increasing it this year um, to bring in more money from revenue. So that is actually a revenue tool that we do have right now. Just Perfect. wanted to let you know that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Next, Brittany Karen or Karan? Karen? Brittany, I believe you're online. Um, hi, so I am Brittany Caron, and I'm a resident of Ward 19, so Beaches East York. Uh, like many of you here today, 
I was really dismayed to see the mayor's budget proposal and pretty much have been also dismayed to see each of his budget proposals over the last eight years. Um, so over the last few years in particular, I think it's become impossible not to notice the sharp decline in the quality of our city services and infrastructure. So as we face uh, an $815 million budget gap, as we know, Mayor Tory is planning to further cut funding to some city services and to increase some user fees. At the same time, he plans to increase the Toronto Police Services budget by nearly $50 million. So I support an increase in property taxes as a way to more equitably fund essential public services like the TTC and shelters, not to fund police. Over the last weeks, I've helped write and disseminate a letter signed by many homeowners affirming that I'm not the only one. I and many others want to pay higher property taxes beyond even what the mayor has proposed for 2023 so that we can all access the services we need to thrive in this city. I believe that the decline in the city services are a direct result of decisions the city council has made over the last decade to keep property tax increases below inflation while at the same time choosing to grow an already bloated police budget. As a parent, it has become increasingly evident to me how the austerity measures of our city council are keeping programs and city services inaccessible to the average family. Enrolling my child into a city program is a near impossible task as I compete with hundreds and thousands of other parents for the limited spots. Our public library, I cannot even begin to overstate its value, will see cuts this year with the proposed under inflation budget increase. This is despite the mayor's insistence that he is prioritizing children and families in this budget. Last year, Toronto had the lowest property taxes in Ontario. This is baffling to me in the largest city in the country, a city with increased need for services, a backlog of essential capital repairs, and unfunded climate commitments. Meanwhile, in 2022, nearly a quarter of our property taxes were spent on policing in our city. This is the wrong approach. Taxes are the most fair and reliable way to fund our municipal public services. Among Torontonians, homeowners are in the best position to pay a little more to cover the necessary costs of running a thriving, inclusive city. Without appropriate taxation, the city turns to user fees like the 10 cent TTC fair hike proposal. This is the most regressive way to pay for services because it hits our working class neighbors hardest. Though the mayor insists that property taxes will make life unaffordable for homeowners, I, as a new homeowner myself, disagree. What makes life most unaffordable for me is the rising cost of everything else when the city fails to provide the services we need most. The cost of a car when transit fails me and my family, the cost of private programs when city programs are not available, and the full price childcare I pay for because I remain on a wait list for a subsidized spot are costing me much more than the annual $233 extra the average homeowner will pay under the proposed increase. We also know that we can't police our way to safety. Marginalized communities, frontline workers and researchers have long explained, the best way to make our city safe is not to invest in police, but rather to double down on poverty reduction strategies by investing heavily in housing, education and other social services. Having spent a decade in social services, shelters and housing work myself, I can attest to the desperation that results in the years long wait lists for life saving services and public housing. I remain steadfast in my commitment to improving the city we live in and I'm clearly not alone. This is true despite an utter lack of imagination among our elected officials, a refusal to aspire to greatness and to instead settle for the predictable kind of governance that has disenfranchised so many, that leads to low voter turnouts, and that is resulting in a general feeling of hopelessness among many of our residents. I am urging city council members to be brave and to vote against the proposed plan to increase funds for the police and against a fair increase in service cuts to the TTC. Though it's difficult to imagine the mayor with a $100,000 salary from Rogers voting against the interests of corporations and wealthy friends, I encourage you to think differently. I would love to see you not only raise property taxes, at least with inflation, but also to lean into other progressive tax measures, one that has seen success elsewhere, such as the proposed vehicle tax, a commercial parking levy, et cetera, in order to pay for the services that would truly benefit us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no questions, we'll go on next to the next three is Camilla Singh, Evelyn Fox, and Victoria Bisback. Camilla Singh is uh, on video conference from Scarborough Civic Action Network. Camilla, are you with us? Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe Camilla is not connected. Okay, we'll circle back. 
Evelyn Fox. Okay, not connected. Victoria Bisback. Victoria, are you? Nope. Okay, well, let's try the next three. Pearl Zhang, Ashwani Bardwaj, Noor Mohammed Cardi. Is Pearl Zhang with us? Welcome, Pearl. Go ahead, and you'll have five minutes. Just have to press the button in front of you. Perfect, thanks. Okay. Hello, my name is Pearl Zhang, and I'm the digital media strategist for the Toronto Youth Cabinet, our city's official youth advisory board. I'm 16 years old in grade 11 at Victoria Park Collegiate Institute near Scarborough, and I'm in the IB program. It's currently a Wednesday night, a school night, and I should be preparing for my economics exam next week, but instead I'm here. And I'm here to tell you that my school doesn't feel like a safe place anymore. Just two months ago, I was watching the ticking clock in my chemistry classroom, waiting for the bell to ring so I could go home. But then our principal called a lockdown. We quickly hid under our desks in silence for about 40 minutes. And we all knew this couldn't have been a drill because it just wouldn't have made sense for the principal to call one just as we were about to leave. And later we discovered that a suspected weapon was seen in our neighborhood. But that wasn't even the worst situation. Last May, my French class decided to go outside at about 11 a.m. to enjoy the long missing sunny weather that Toronto was offering. We sat on the bleachers next to our school parking lot. And just as I was conjugating verbs, just 20 meters away in front of us, we heard gunshots. Two, maybe three. And we didn't even have enough time to react. We stood in shock, reassuring ourselves that it couldn't have been a gun. Maybe someone was just setting off fireworks in the middle of the day. But sure enough, we were hurried back by teachers into the school with not a single file line, but our entire class squeezing through two narrow doors in panic. I got separated from my classmates and was taken in by another teacher. I entered this dark classroom with the blinds down and dead silence. I sat with two of my friends in this classroom for three and a half hours. We couldn't speak, so we just huddled around together, staring at each other with looks of fear. And I wasn't even sure if I should text my mom. Should I have told her that, should I have told her my best wishes in case something went wrong, or should I have saved her from worrying? And days later, we discovered that it was targeted violence between students. Social workers and extra staff from other schools stormed our hallways to support us, but the root cause was never fixed. In November of 2021, a huge fight broke out after school, which resulted in a 15-year-old boy getting stabbed and dying, another act of targeted violence. I'm tired of reading headlines like students shot in parking lot of VPCI, male stabbed during a fight outside VPCI. I should be hearing about the success of students and how our school community is an uplifting experience. I'm tired of reading my principal's messages of condolences after every incident. I'm tired of seeing my classmates break down in tears each time. What is the city doing to prevent these incidents in the first place? And why do we go to schools where violence is an, act, an annual occurrence? And I know the city already has some youth violence prevention measures implemented, such as the Community Peers Program and the Restorative Justice Programs to help guide students and help them through these difficult periods, but it isn't enough. Clearly, if at least one student at my school gets into an accident every school year, these programs are not doing enough, and not to mention the violence that goes among youth at other schools. We must see this budget include investments in the following areas. Number one, creation of more youth hubs and enhanced youth spaces, as well as expanded hours of current hubs and spaces. We must ensure every neighborhood improvement area has an active youth hub where young people can have access to recreational programming and support services. Number two, increased funding to violence prevention grants, such as the Identify and 
and impact program, which have shown to be successful in enhancing opportunities for youth and promoting broader community safety. And number three, a creation of a summer youth employment program to ensure youth have access to mentorship opportunities and jobs that will aid them on their path toward a future of career success and economic security. So today, I'm here to ask you to listen to me. And on behalf of all youth in Toronto, we are sick of the violence, and we ask for you to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pearl. Councillor Moyes has a question for you. Thank you so much for your heartfelt uh, deputation. Um, as a school, former school board trustee, you know, I, I, I hear you, and I, I do show your frustration. Um, and I know you're very young, but I asked this question anyway. Do you feel that uh, the school boards and the city can do more to um, address some of these issues collectively? Um, yes, I think they can definitely do more to help um, instead of just focusing on the after effects. And I do understand that for my school personally, we had social workers come in to help us with our mental health and everything. But I believe that the root problem was never solved and nothing was done to help that root problem, which is why it keeps occurring again and again. Okay, well, thanks again. Know that the school board and the city are actually currently working to address some of the issues that you've talked about here. Thank you. Deputy Mayor McKelvey. Thank you. The summer, uh, so the employment program that you're talking about, um, how would we, if we were to go about doing that, what would be the best way for us to advertise it? Because that's what I always worry about is how do we connect with youth um, in the best way? So has the, the Youth Council given any thought to that? Um, I think better ways to advertise it would be um, maybe just like coming into schools and actually having people there being representatives and having people come and talk about um, these different issues and how we can solve them. So with these different youth employment programs and just like advertising it that way, just so the help is actually getting reached to where the help needs to be reached. Yeah. Okay, that that's helpful because I think, you know, we always think, well, websites and social media, but I don't think that gets to Yes. You, so you think it's actually getting there in person mm -hmm. and getting the information kind of in their hand directly. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thompson has a question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. Pearl, thank you so much for being here. Um, your presentation is uh, quite helpful. I'm wondering, um, you listed a number of um, issues that have taken place at your school, vi very violent issues and so on. Um, just particularly as it relates to your school, I'm wondering what has the school done to implement measures to try to address these types of problems? Because obviously you've illustrated, I think, at least three very serious problems. It's just wondering what has the school done specifically to address those problems? So at my school, we've had at the beginning of the year an assembly that uh, is from our principal to address all the violence. and. Um, explain how we can stop the violence. So we had an assembly at the beginning of the year. And we've also had these challenges where students should go drug-free, violence-free, and these different challenges taking place around our school. And those are all measures that my um, teachers and staff have taken. Okay, that's uh, very helpful. Um, some time ago, um, the schools, not all of them, had the school resource officers. Do you think that school resources resource officers would have an impact in terms of not eliminating violence per se, but having some measured impact on addressing the issues around violence? How do you feel about school resource officers being in the school and their police officers as such? Um, having, I think having these police officers in our school would be a bit nerve-wracking for all students. Um, I don't think it would necessarily make us feel safer because it's very intimidating to have police officers just roaming around our school, and that has happened before. We, we, I think we have had police officers just roaming around our school, and although it's, I know the intention is to make us feel more safe, um, it doesn't always necessarily come off that way. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you very much for your time here today. Thank you. We're actually going to go back to the first person uh, who I mentioned, um, Sitan Burkik, I believe is online. Uh, could you hear me, Chair? We can. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, and I do apologize uh, for any inconvenience uh, for tonight. Um, first and foremost, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Svitan Berkic. I actually am a current uh, student in the Master pa uh, um, uh, Master Student of Public Policy Administration Law Program in, at York University, and I'm also I currently also work in Human Resources. And I'm also currently a resident in, in Ward 20, Scarborough Southwest. I actually, re I love the city. I love the city of Toronto. I've been, I've lived now in Scarborough now for the past eight months. And I've seen a couple of things that really concern me. So I've seen things like potholes on the roads. I've seen um, solid waste management, not picking garbage regularly or collectively. And I've also seen um, through my partner who lives with me, issues with public transit. I understand totally for the fact that, you know, we need to make these investments, but I want to ensure that, that these investments are made in a prudent, fiscal, responsible manner. I feel that as a resident who pays, you know, pays their fair share and wants to live in the city of Toronto and still wants to engage with the city of Toronto. I want to make sure that these investments are targeted to what is needed for. But then I also have concerns with say public transit, the cutting of services. I still have parents that live in Toronto that also take the TTC. And I know that these services affect, would affect them as they don't drive a vehicle. That also includes my partner who actually takes the TTC to go to work unless I'm there to drive. I'm also in concern with the fact that with the police budget, but I not in terms of the hiring of police officers, but what's being done more in terms of for mental health and incorporating mental health and its involvement. I have no issue with hiring police officers as it is we're trying to make our city safe. Also, I just wanted to make sure to give you guys understanding that, you know, when I'm working from home and I'm seeing solid waste management, you know, you know, when we're having our garbage collection and, and where I live on 21 Rockwood Drive, I see sometimes that there's no kind of inclination from the people that, you know, when we're trying to throw, you know, trying to have our garbage collected, sometimes it's never picked up or when I do call 311, um, you know, sometimes they try to tell me that, you know, you have to, you know, this is the, this is the procedure. All I want to ensure is that with this budget today and with this budget that, that, that is being proposed, that the money is allocated in a prudent f fiscal financial manner, and it is go targeting to the resources that are required. And I just don't want to see more of a city that when we, where we live in tonight, to go, you know, go in the opposite direction. And I love the city. I currently serve on the board with the George Bell Arena Board of Management. And I want to continue being engaged. But I also want to ensure tonight that as part of me speaking is to ensure that we live in a safe, livable, you know, great city. And we do ensure that those resources that are required, that are maintained, and to ensure that we we make sure that we have that always uh, in, in front of mind, especially um, when you guys are making these decisions. I know that these decisions are tough and understandably because of what's going what's going on this year with this city, this year's city budget. But I want to ensure that if we do the necessary steps and maintain it that we are moving in the right direction. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you guys. For, thank you very much for, for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your comments. 
The next three speakers are Ashwani Bardwaj, Nur Mohammed Kardi, and Zain Kuram. Ashwani? Yes. Welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chair uh, Budget Committee. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ashwani Bhardwaj, uh, and I'm a long-time resident of the Scarborough. I'm a Tory, and Council Crawford, as Chair of the Budget Committee, presented this budget, which I call is a pretty strategic planning that will keep our communities safe. As the expansion of the Neighborhood Community Officer Program, which announced under this budget, which includes 162 more officer and 22 more major case management officers and 16 more officers to the neighborhood community policing. Neighborhood community policing is very important to us. I'm also the president of Hindu Culture Society in Lakshmi Narayan Temple. Our facility, which is located in Scarborough in the morning side and morning view trail, we always had a problem uh, with some of the miscreants use our property, far end of the property, bring the cars in and use uh, this timing and, and for wrongdoing things. And we tried our best to connect with the, the police and we got response. And in that case, uh, we also managed to have a meeting with uh, Superintendent Gregory Watts on last Sunday on January the 15th, and which he assured us that there will be an audit of the building and the audit of the, the prayers meeting and all that. And we are very thankful to the, do that. In, in doing that, it also confirmed that we, as this budget is bringing more officers to the neighborhood policing, that will really help us in leading our prayers and our facilities more conveniently and more peacefully as well. Now, the addition of 20 additional that 911 operators that being added and, uh, so, and the service response time is uh, being addressed in this budget. I can bring it to the whole committee here, my own personal experience. Relating to a 911 call, it was November 21st last year at 9.45. I called from my home, 911, and I was put on hold to wait for another operator to come on and take the call. I was waiting for five to six minutes before the call was taken. Thank God the situation was not life and death situation in, that, in, our, in our case. We could wait and we waited. But imagine if there's a cardiac arrest and you put on hold a call for five to six minutes where every minute cost and seven to eight percent of the revival chance loses by every minute there. I'm also request you know, to the Mayor Tory and, and the committee to please, under this budget or in future, make your public institutions well equipped with the defibrillators and with the CRP trained personnel in there. I'm pretty sure they are there, but if you have heard uh, Dr. Francis Champlain from the Montreal Hospital, he started a campaign making it accessible, easily accessible for the defibrillator in the public institutions and all that. We should work on that same way. If this call can be taken right away, the, the lives can be saved. And addition of 20 operators to that will go a long way. And in this budget just not ends here. It invests hiring in 250 paramedics and 10 million in community paramedics and emergency call mitigation, which will further strengthen this 911 call in the operator and the safety of the community and the individuals living in, in this society will feel safe and will feel protected. We do need social infrastructure built as well. We need parks and the housing as well. 
But in that case, definitely we do need the safety of our children and our kids using those parks. You might have heard about the Chesterley Park yeah, thing as well. Wrap up, please. So we do need, we appreciate the, what the steps taken for the hiring of the more police officers and the paramedics and all that. But we want to also make sure that the, 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 the safety is the first one. And if this budget get approved, it, the $2 billion that was housing initiative, which will go a long way. And we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. We're going to go. Thank you. I think we're OK. No OK, questions. thank you. I appreciate your time tonight. Um, we're going to go back to two of the uh, speakers who are actually here now. Camilla Singh is with us. Camilla, welcome. Hi, good evening. There we go. Thank you for coming. You have five minutes. All right, thank you. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today regarding the City of Toronto's 2023 proposed budget. My name is Camille Singh and I am the coordinator for the Scarborough Civic Action Network, also known as SCAN. I'm here tonight to represent SCAN. Uh, SCAN is a nonpartisan community driven network that aims to support civic engagement activities across Scarborough and work to build civic action pathways to address priority issues of community safety, affordable housing and public transit through capacity building, information sharing, and supporting civic action opportunities. For 2023, SCAN calls for a budget, a city budget, that will support upstream investments in community safety. Instead of investing in policing, our city must prioritize work to address the root causes of community safety, including investments in safety, a community safety and well-being plan, affordable and safe housing, and ensuring safe and reliable public transit. Toronto Safety O Plan aims to expand the definition of community safety to go beyond policing and to consider well being, focus on preventative measures um, and approaches to dealing with trauma and mental health and the city's response to community safety. And according to the City of Toronto, this plan um, means investments in reducing vulnerability, violence, investments in people and neighborhoods, and investments in advancing truth and reconciliation, promoting healing and justice. Residents of Scarborough are more adversely impacted by these issues and a preventative action plan such as the Toronto Safety O Plan is imperative. This proposed budget, specifically the proposed investment into policing, moves in the opposite direction. Rather than investing an additional 48.3 million into police services, uh, this money would be better spent investing in addressing community safety in line with the Safety O Plan. Uh, by supporting projects and initiatives like the Toronto Communities Crisis Service Pilots programs um, and ensuring housing affordability and ensuring safe housing standards are being met across the city and by improving safety and reliability of public transit that's heavily relied upon by those in vulnerable populations. And SCAN's work with the community uh, throughout the year. Some of the biggest concerns raised uh, were around affordable housing and access to reliable transit. Feelings of safety can be rooted in stability and for Scarborough residents, there's a lot of uncertainty around finding affordable housing, around finding safe living conditions within affordable housing spaces and options and concerns about their ability to stay housed. Investments from the city to address these concerns and ensure that housing is affordable and safe to inhabit are needed. We also heard stories from families who struggle to navigate inaccessible public transit. One woman shared with us her experience of you know, having to walk a long distance from her home to the nearest bus stop in order just to get groceries. And it was only after waiting for a bus that never came that she eventually walked the three blocks to the store and walked back with her groceries and no bus passed her that entire time. Public transit was something that she was relying on and it failed her. Other struggles that Scarborough residents have shared with us is how far and few between stops are, how infrequent the buses and streetcars are. Um, there is a need for more stops as it can be difficult for those who rely on the TTC as their primary mode of transportation. Um, for those who are elderly, for shift workers, um, women and low income people, those who have strollers, groceries, etc. For them to trek these far distances, it's important for them to have a transit system that's frequent, 
reliable, and accessible. Scarborough will already be feeling these impacts due to the closure of the Scarborough RT this year, and the subway extension isn't expected until 2030. The proposed TTC budget will result in longer wait times across all modes of transit and an increased crowding standard. Not only will this make the TTC more inaccessible for those who are demanding greater accessibility, it will disproportionately impact those who rely on TTC as their primary mode of travel. These cuts will lead to less people accessing TTC in lieu of other more reliable, more accessible modes of transit will lead to unsafe conditions as less as at stops um, that are less populated and for those who have no option other than TTC or walking. Reducing service frequency, increasing fares and increasing crowding limits uh, will only add to the burden of Scarborough residents and public transit. We're asking that your city budget uh, consider um, allowing TTC to be more frequent and reliable service across Scarborough and the GTA. SCAN implores you to consider these points and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. We also have uh, Evelyn Fox who just joined us. Evelyn, you with us? I can't get myself off mute. Thank you. Oh. Yes, I am. Thank you. Great. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, as you stated, my name is Evelyn Fox. I am the founder of Communities for Zero Violence, an organization that I founded after the homicide of my son Kissinger Gunn in 2016. I unfortunately had to lose my son to become educated on the reasons why community violence occurs the steps to take to significantly decrease it and the politics that surrounds this issue. When I hear the police budget is set to increase, it becomes a significant level of frustration because myself and other community advocates, health professionals and the police services across Canada have all stated that we cannot police ourselves out of an issue that has lacked the political will and investment it desperately requires to save the lives of our youth. When I hear more money for police, I instantly think of how many lives will be lost, how many families and communi communities will be devastated and continue to suffer as the city, city con continues to divert much needed money from the community resources. There have been abundant amount of studies per, um, done that speak to the needs, um, what needs to be done to deter youth from violent acts and engaging in at-risk lifestyles. They have the same primary recommendations, addressing poverty, breaking down societal and systemic racism, affordable quality housing, youth mental health support, education, supports for families with youth engaged in at-risk behavior, child and youth programming and youth employment opportunities, stable funding for agencies that serve predominantly impacted communities. A significant factor that keeps the cycle of violence going is trauma. The impacts of community violence, whether you have witnessed or been subjected to a trauma traumatic loss of a family member or a friend is detrimental and leaves you with feelings of hopelessness, overwhelming thoughts of suicide and retaliation, feelings of being unsafe and always being on alert for the potential of another act of violence to occur. Children and youth who are impacted by violence have difficulty processing the event, and those who witness their parents or parents suffer from the loss of their sibling often engage in self-medicating and act out as they do not have the supports that are necessary within the school system or in the community to address what is going on within their minds. Community violence is also stigmatizing, which creates a barrier to families pursuing support as well. Even though there have been positive strides forward with the Community Healing Project, Stella's Place, Mothers of Peace, and Out of Bounds, these are the only community agencies that one does not have to have a referral from crisis response or victim services. Many of the community members and family members do not qualify for these referrals and still require support and in predominantly impacted communities, some youth, youth have lost a sibling and multiple peers to violence. And as Dr. Annette Bailey, a professor at the University of Toronto once stated, they have experienced the erosion of their social network. 
when trauma is not addressed, many parents and siblings were, who were pre previously employed before the traumatic event often develop PTSD due to the event and are unable to keep and sustain employment. This leads to people relying on the financial systems of either Ontario Works, Ontario Disability Support Program, or Canada Pension Disability, or a combination of. At this time, I'm requesting that sustainable funding be allocated to the community organizations that provide trauma support to children, youth, and families. Prevention will always be the most fisc fisc fiscally responsible way to save lives over reactive measures, supported with the much needed support for aftercare. It has been six and a half years since the homicide of my son and the eighth year that John Tory has been mayor in Toronto, and we still haven't progressed when it concerns violence reduction and solid, sustainable investment to community-based services. It takes time to see the results of these measures. We, we need to properly in, invest in these initiatives. Imagine where we would have been if we'd started back in 2014. How many lives would have been saved? How many communities would have had the opportunity to heal and prosper? Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Councillor Myers has a question. Uh, hi, Evelyn. Uh, first, I'd just like to start by offering my condolences for your son. Um, earlier today, we heard a speaker, um, Louis Merch, who founded uh, Communities for Zero Gun Violence, and he had a very similar message to yours. Um, you know, having reviewed the budget, is there one or two things that you think that we should focus on to get at the root of the violence that is plaguing so many communities in Toronto? Um, yes, Louis March is actually Zero Gun Violence Movement. And Sorry about that. Communities for Zero Violence. That's okay. Um, in regards to housing, the the housing, like uh, for instance, I used to live in in the Grassways, which is now been demolished. But Five Needle Furway is still standing, and the exterior of the building got a very nice facelift. But the interior units of the building are still very deplorable. We have people who live in housing that live in these conditions who feel as though they're not worthy of living in, in quality housing. There's deplorable housing all across the city, not to mention the fact that some people have moved out of housing because of safety issues or needed emergency transfers. And the way that the emergency transfer um, is now is that you are only allowed one option or you're removed from the emergency transfer. And some people have very, very grave emergency situations where they don't feel safe. Um, so then that leads them into market rent, which they cannot afford and instability. So quality um, affordable housing is a very significant issue in, in this situation as well. Um, and I think that the way that housing, the whole housing process works really needs to be revamped. Um, another thing, I apologize, I lost my train of thought, but the public health as well, right, with the mental health supports. I can't express enough how much the mental health supports need funding. It is impossible to find support after someone has been killed or if, you, or if you've even witnessed the act. It's really very difficult to find anything that is culturally specific um, or even find anything at all. And then when you do find it, um, it's not covered by OHIP. It's only covered by victim services and you get 10 sessions. And I still today struggle six years later and there's times that I often have to take off work for my own mental health but I have I'm lucky enough to have a position that um in an agency that respects and and you know takes care of me so but a lot of people don't have that we have unstable jobs people who are on contract that 
automation is taking over all the starter and youth jobs and positions. It like we need something to be able to give hope to these youth. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Appreciate your words. Next, uh, three speakers, Noor Mohammed Cardi, Zane Karam, and Anne-Marie Stevens. Noor Mohammed, I think you're online. Noor Mohammed. Okay. Zane Karam. Welcome, Zane, whenever you're ready. Good evening, City Councillors. My name is Zane Kurum. I'm the Transit Lead for the Toronto Youth Cabinet. Established in 1998 by Toronto City Council, Toronto Youth Cabinet is the official youth advocacy body for, uh, to the city. We are a youth-led organization that promotes youth participation in municipal affairs and policy developments. In May, we will be celebrating 25 years of youth-led initiatives and achievements, such as uh, pushing to keep TDC, TDSB pools open in 2002, starting the yearly impact and identify grant, a community grant in 2008, bringing financial literacy to the high school cur curriculum in 20, 2016, and most recently in 2021, by bringing, uh, making f feminine hygiene products available and free in all publicly funded um, schools across Ontario. The Toronto Youth Cabinet cares deeply about our city's youth and recognizes that youth are one of the biggest um, users of public transportation for two obvious, obvious reasons, uh, being unable to legally drive and um, being unable to afford the high costs associated with owning uh, private vehicles. Public transit is a critical gateway and a necessity for youth commuting between school, home, or work and access, accessing essential services or meeting with friends. For several years before the pandemic, City Council has raised TDC fares well beyond the rate of inflation, while minimizing increases to property taxes and declining to Im implement any other major revenue sources for transit operations. The pandemic has only made life increasingly unaffordable and with a 10 cent increase to adults and youth fares, post-secondary students will be impacted by the fare increase because there is no single fare discount uh, for post-secondary students. Many can't afford the upfront costs of a monthly pass and uh, of a monthly pass. Not only should the fare increase be reversed, but now is the right time for the TDC um, to bring in fare capping, which means you will be able to ride, uh, ride transit for free after you tap enough single ride fares to cover the cost of a monthly pass. Now, many youth are working low-wage jobs, unemployed or paying tuition, facing sky-high housing costs or mounting student debt. Uh, they are at the breaking point, and now City Council needs to recognize the ill effects of a fare increase on the livelihood of Toronto's youth. City Council needs to increase funding to the Toronto Transit Commission so that we can reverse the upcoming fare increases. There are better alternatives to, out there that can generate revenue for the TDC, um, like, a com, uh, community, uh, like a commercial parking levy, levy, which has been proposed by several community groups um, across, the, uh, across the city. The city should also seek enhanced funding from the provincial government, as currently we are the lowest subsidized transit agency in the province. But ultimately, the city should stop putting the burden on on, uh, of generating revenue on the riders who depend and utilize this essential service every day. City Council really needs to put in the work to ensure that a TDC is efficient, accessible, and affordable for all transit users, including youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Anne-Marie Stevens. And Anne-Marie's online, I believe. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Committee, and Mr. Mayor. My name is Anne-Marie Stevens, and I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to speak not only on my behalf, but also on behalf of families who also live in the Danzig community regarding the Danzig Community House. <clears throat> Excuse me. We as a Danzig community want to see change, and that means having programs for people across the board, young and mature. The Danza Community House is a great space for all to enjoy when we do have programs available. At this point in time, it is only open if something is happening. We would like to see programs available on a regular basis. 
We would also like to see that our neighborhood is prioritized and not just stigmatized by the unfortunate events that have taken place. We would like to have good people with backgrounds to assist with issues that may arise. For example, if a person needs assistance with resume writing or just detailing uh, for a specific job, um, the house right now has computers, but we would need people with experience and have resources to assist. Uh, we would like to see leadership and mentoring programs. We would also like to see programs for the younger youths, not just during the school year, but during summer as well. We need programs surrounding mental health as it is a big issue for everyone. We would also like to have programs surrounding violence reduction. We understand the importance of the Danza Community House and applaud the efforts that have been made in order to get programs running. However, we would like to see that programs that are spoke about actually get up and running. In closing, Danzig has seen its fair share of unfortunate effect, sorry, unfortunate events. We would like to see its fair share of opportunities. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. We do have a question from Deputy Mayor McKelvey. Hi, Anne Marie. Thank sure. you. Thank you for deputing. If um, if they were to reopen that hub on a more permanent basis, do you think that the local residents would be willing to give suggestions around the programming they'd like to see? And, and you mentioned a few things, but do you think there's an appetite to to provide feedback into the vision for that space? Most definitely. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, parents that I have spoken with have also offered to um, volunteer their time. Oh, thank you. Okay, and you mentioned that you saw this not just being a space for youth, but also for um, everyone in the community in that, in that capacity as well. So that's kind of your vision for it. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Councillor Thompson has a question. Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. Chair, through you to Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, thank you very much for your presentation. So you're telling us that the um, the unit that was designated as a community hub only functions on a part-time basis? That is correct. That is only when there are programs that are available. Currently, we have tutoring right. uh, for children grades uh, 1 to 8. Uh, and that's uh, once a week for the grade 1 to 4s. And uh, for the 5s to 8, that's as, as, as well once a week. Um, and that's pretty much the only thing that's happening there right now. Oh, I'm quite surprised, actually, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But um, many years ago, we worked with yes. Mr. Adofi, who is a businessman yeah. from, um, from Nigeria. And we, mm -hmm. I worked with him to provide some funding for that facility. And we were told that that would be an ongoing operation, ongoing activities would take place because of the need in the community. So I'm really surprised right. that we don't seem to have an ongoing effort to support that community and to support the young people there in light of the challenges that has been experienced. So I guess my question to you there, we had provided computers and a variety of other uh, technology equipment and so on. Is that still in place? I mean, I, I realize that they would have to be upgraded and so on. But was there a plan? Was there a budget to upgrade any of those facilities? Uh, I'm not sure if there was a budget to upgrade, but we do have the computers that are upstairs and they are of no use right now. They're because just they're just old? Are, because they're uh, old? I'm, I'm, they're just not adequate and there's no program running to have access to those computers. Well, wow, thank you. Uh, I'm shocked. <laughs> As we are, as a dance community. We all have taken notes. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Monica Martinez. Monica Martinez, I think is on. Oh, you're there. Great. Is it on? Oh, it is. Okay. Um, hello, members of the budget committee. My name. One second, I'm nervous. My name is Monica. I'm a resident and community member from Scarborough North. I am a coordinator at the Center for Women and Trans People based out of York University. I am here today to speak about the proposed budget increase for the Toronto Police. I do not agree with it, and I don't think you should either. 
We should be moving towards ending police violence against our communities. We need to direct resources away from harmful institutions and invest in community-based support systems. The Toronto, the Toronto Community Crisis Service is working. It is proven that police pr presence in situations of mental health means death, and having an alternative saves lives. Police do not keep us safe. Community keeps us safe. The pr Toronto Police Service's own data shows that homicides and shootings, including fatalities and injuries, are at a five-year low, and major crimes have been largely, steadi largely steady since 2014. Data from Stats Canada also shows a similar trend. So that begs the question, why do we need over 200 more frontline police officers? Why do we need more special constables for the TTC? To increase harassment and abuse towards our unhoused neighbors? On January 10th, a claw and over 10 police officers removed a tent that one of our neighbors was living in. Shelters have been closing downtown and forcing people onto the street at the coldest time of year. It should not be a radical thought to believe that every human deserves a safe place to live. We are in a housing crisis, a climate crisis, and living in a pandemic. We should be increasing TTC service. We should be providing better education. We should be creating safer community housing. We should be investing in libraries. We should be providing support to our frontline workers in hospitals. We need to fund better transit. By cutting service and increasing fares, people will be driven away from using transit. A single TTC fare cost $1.80 in 2002. If TTC fares had been indexed to inflation rates over the past 20 years, riders would be paying $2.74 per ride in 2022. I urge you folks to think about what the budget says about this city. Choosing healthy communities and real safety and allocating 50% of the TPS budget to urgently needed community supports. Another Toronto is possible. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, hold on. We think we have a question from Councillor Myers. Uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you, Monica, for coming out and deputing tonight. Um, just so you're aware, um, the budget does actually increase the funding for the Toronto Community Crisis Response Teams, um, and it goes from 60 to 80 percent. And some uh, some councillors, including myself and many others, did want to know why we couldn't include that, why we couldn't roll that out to 100 percent coverage. And we were actually told by the department running the type Toronto Crisis Response Teams that they are not ready to roll that out across the city yet. They are still collecting data, and they want to make sure that they are doing uh, doing it properly. Um, so just want to put that out there. But did you, did, know, did you know? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, it's always a question. Sorry, I'm new to this. Uh, did you know? Um, secondly, um, did you know? Yes. <laughs> I did. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I also just wanted to ask, you know, you raised a number of uh, things you'd like to see improved in the city. Uh, is there anything in particular in this budget that you think that we should be focused on that you would like to see the prioritized, the one or two things in particular that you think would make a difference uh, to the people in the city? In particular, things like specifically not slashing um, TTC service, because that is proposed to be reduced, and also the fare is proposed to be increased, which makes no sense. Um, but that is one thing. Also, possibly um, another thing that I said, just providing another thing that could be done is specifically for like children within schools, like. It's been proven that throughout the pandemic, you know, ventilation is something that's important, but a lot of schools that children are, are in don't have windows that open um, or don't have proper filtration systems. So stuff like that, like, and people have said like potholes, like, sh like 20 times already. So like fix the freaking streets, I don't know, <laughs> like stuff like that. Uh, but there's lots of things that um, can be addressed and I think it's absurd to be adding an increase of $48 million to the police when they already have $1.1 billion. And it's proven that police do not actually keep people safe. They don't. So anyway, 
that's my thoughts. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Cool. Have a great day, y'all. Next is S. And the next three people will be Esther Edinkra, Nikita Quantal, and Imram Ali. Esther, welcome. Thank you for having me here today. Hello, my name is Esther, and I've lived in the Ampringham community for over 15 years, so I'll be speaking on behalf of my community. I believe that Ampringham's Hope Center should be utilized as a hub, considering a safe place for residents to engage in activities will be a more active approach towards combating high-risk behaviors. To elaborate, in the last five years, the rate of teen pregnancies have increased significantly. Youth are starting to use drugs at younger ages. Two months ago, there was a suicide that heavily impacted the community as well. I have witnessed fellow residents go in and out of jail, and I've also been impacted by the deaths that occurred over the years due to gang violence. I say all of this to say that if there's a community that will benefit from the funding in a hub, it's Empringham. When I was in elementary school, I utilized the after, the after school program, which occurred in the Hope Center. There was board games, we had snacks, like we made friends, the community was more closer. Moving forward, I would like to see programs revolving around mental health. Feedback that I received from the youth boys was that um, when their friend actually got stabbed at Scarborough Town Center, they had no one to talk to about it. So I feel like these programs would help stop that ripple effect as this happened to me, I'm going to go out and do that to someone else. And that's how gang violence starts and how it continues. Additional programs can also include like a women's group considering there, there are a lot of single mothers who may benefit from having a support system. A hub as a safe place to do homework, read, pass time in a, an appropriate manner. Therefore, if a community space was granted with funding to implement various programs, I do believe that the youth and adult crime rate will decrease and members of the community will be more engaged for an overall more positive environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor McKelvey has a question for you. Hi, thank you for coming today. I know it was quite a community. Thank you for having here. me. Um, same question that I asked the earlier deputant. So if we were to reopen the Hope Center and that community hub, do you think residents um, of all ages would be interested in kind of saying what is the vision for that space and what what type of program should happen in there? 100%. Okay. And again, you see it as, you know, for you, you mentioned some different groups you think could use that. So you think of a variety of youth in the community. Youth all the way up to adults. Because right now there's only one program that, um, sorry, it's not even a program. It's a food bank. Yeah. That's the only thing that's happening in the Hope Center right now. We used to have like a breakfast club. Yes, used to have a lot going on when I was younger. And now that I'm older and I look back and I say, this is all we have. And then all the crime that's happening. Maybe if kids had something to do, you know, they wouldn't be on the streets, being influenced by what's out there and like have a safe place to focus on. You don't have to be like what Empringham has stood for over the years. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Next is Nikita Quintal. Nikita, are you with us? Quintel's online. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Nikita, yes we can. Thanks, Nikita. Whenever you're ready. Sorry. Hi, my name is Nikita Quintal. I'm also a member from the community of Danzig. I just want to say um, hello to the councillors, chair members committee and the mayor. So I am just going to touch a little bit more on basis of what Anne Marie stated earlier. I've also lived in Danzig for over 23 years and I've been here through, of course, the bad and the good. To touch on a little bit more, we've had a local staff member from THC Violence Reduction offer services to our youth and actually follow through with these services. So whether it be take them to little things, we've had STEM programs, we've had um, after school programs at 4301 and just actually seeing the children in my area, including my own children, go to these programs, just the the effect it has on them, just seeing them come home and and experiencing these things and having the ability to do that, it, it's it's a good sign for them. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So what I would like to see is change in my community with the programs and having access to the resources that would benefit for them. 
including adults and children. The Danzig Community House is a very great space that all my kids and even kids that I know around the area enjoy. I would also like to see programs that have adequate funding available on a regular basis. I've seen people in my own community lose their own child steps away from their door. Seeing the effect it has on my community, including my own children, has taken a toll on all of them. There's not enough resources for mental health when it comes to situations like that for them, where we have access to these programs. Of course, the, the youth in our area, along with other trauma due to the also, it would be to have access to food banks that are around the course of the country and the population. Nikita, it's, it's uh, Councillor Crawford here. We're having difficulty hearing you. You're very broken. Sorry, um, I don't know. You're better now. I just well, don't know. Yeah, sorry. So that pretty much just sums up everything. I just wanted to, like I said, I have the same issues and problems as Anne-Marie stated earlier. We do live in the same community, and she pretty much touched on a lot of the things that I have. Okay, thank, thank you. Appreciate your time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is Imram Ali, who's also on video conference. Imram, are you with us? There we go. Welcome, Imran. You'll have five minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Imran Ali, and I'm an Imam, Muslim faith leader, working and serving as a full-time employed Imam in Toronto. Uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me the opportunity to speak today, and hello to the committee and the mayor. Uh, fair warning, when a preacher is given the opportunity to speak under five minutes. Uh, as a serving faith leader since mid-2000 in Toronto, I see the coin from both sides. However, today I'm here to support the city's investment in emergencies and public safety in the 2023 budget. Emergency first responders put their own lives on the line for our safety. They protect our communities and our families. They take action when disaster strikes. When everyone else is running away from an emergency, it is the first responders that are running towards it. They're brave, selfless, and determined. I believe the budget is empowering these heroic public servants who protect us, respond to our calls of distress, and care for us in our darkest moments. I believe that the budget will include a substantial investment for youth and families, allocation to anti-violence programming, and to address roots of violence and build on existing programming to support youth and supporting employment, youth employment. In my humble opinion, the investments of the 2023 budget is focused on protecting frontline services, addressing resident concerns, and ensuring continued safety for everyone. With regards to policing, unless we have, unless we stop having bad people, we are in need of policing. Uh, one of the areas is crisis response. In conversation with my colleagues of other faiths, we recognize that people come for prayers when they're not well, for example, for cardiac issues. But in addition to prayers, they still go to the cardiologist. When families bring a loved one who is struggling with mental health for prayers, and we pray with them, but then they believe it's a faith problem, and they don't want to seek medical help, then we have a problem. We need people to seriously access mental health services and let's not leave it until it becomes unmanage unmanageable and don't believe that the time we need the experts and we don't need police at that time. Police do have training to recognize mental health. However, when someone is aggressive, 
that's not the time we need the experts. That's the time we need protection from the police to save that person and those around them. Another aspect with regards to policing, the neighborhood community, the neighborhood community officer program. What a marvelous initiative. This is a powerful program which is changing the youth perspective on policing. However, and while not ignoring the past, our adults need to give our youth space to experience the positive concept of policing. Seeing an officer in uniform high-fiving a, a youth in a place of worship and other areas is simply priceless. And that also brings me to with the recent violence in schools, why don't we have the school resource program or officers program? I believe that when we listen to the youth, we're going to hear how they view policing and not necessarily what some of us as adults pass on to them about policing. In conclusion, I would like to say that the police has many resources to benefit our community. And these resources are underutilized by the community. It is time for us to work with the police to build a better society. We, not, we must stop the past of us against them. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak. And I will always stand between the police and the community in bridging the gap. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Imam. Next is Ezekiel Tully. Ezekiel Tully, it's online. Yeah. Great. Yeah, this is Ezekiel. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Um, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Hello and good evening. To those who don't know me, my name is Ezekiel Tully. I've lived in Empingham my whole life. Although I'm only 19 years of age, I've been around long enough to see Empingham's ups and downs. I've also been around long enough to see the benefits of the entire program, our, our community center. Sorry. While I was younger, Eppingham had its community center up and running, which, was, which granted the neighborhood a multitude of opportunities, teaching the younger ones life lessons they would need as they grow, and teaching the older, teaching the older youth, giving the older youth a chance to be a leader and a positive role model within the community. Also giving them a chance to get out of the event, get out of the negative stigma associated with Empingham. Within our community center, like within our community and not having our community center up and having none of the programs that it was running before, I watched as all the younger all the younger children around me that I helped like play a hand in raising and I watched grow just get in trouble more and more with the law and other individuals as well. Now I see that I've taken a different route and I've approached life with a different perspective. And this was thanks to a great deal to our community center and the positive role models that I had in my life and the opportunities that my community center gave to me. And with that, I believe that Empringham should receive more funding to get a community hub because if we don't intervene uh, with the young while they're young and impressionable, they're gonna grow up with the wrong perspective on life and they're gonna grow up with a chip on their shoulder. And like Esther said earlier, once somebody does something to them and they don't have anybody to talk to or any way to cope with that pain and that trauma that's going on, they're just gonna go out into the street and retaliate because that's the only thing they know how to do. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Next is Shell, next three people, Shell Goldstein, Fiza Khalid and Zuzana Betkova. Shell is also on video conference with us. Welcome, Shell. Uh, hi, can you see me? I don't see me on screen. Well, we can hear you for sure. I can't see you yet. If you put your video on, we could. Okay, I would love to do that. Um, oh, I'm finding this WebEx challenging. How do I do that? Why is that not obvious? Is 
Can someone, I can do it without. Um, if, if you wish, you can speak verbally. We can hear you quite well. Okay, how, but how can I turn my camera on? That should be easy. Um, I'm trying to suggest. Do you see an icon that looks like a camera? Or start no, video? No, that would be obvious. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm I know. See. Technology. Okay. okay, so can you put the time back to my five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, don't worry. I'm, I'm waiting for you to start talking, and okay, I'll start. Here we go. Hi, my name is Shell Goldstein. I wish I could see. You. I wish you could see me, um, but maybe it's a, maybe it's actually a benefit. Um, I'm the granddaughter of a woman uh, who, with her sister uh, and uh, and their husbands and their young family, somehow managed to get out of uh, peasant difficult program areas of. Lithuania, Russia, border towns, and somehow got to Canada and emigrated and moved to uh, Owen Sound where there was shipbuilding opportunities in like 1906. I'd like to quote Chris Moyce, who was brilliant yesterday in talking. I, list, I was able to listen in and I'm paraphrasing and sometimes bang on saying that the percentage of homeless folks are dealing with addiction and mental health problems. And these people are from municipalities elsewhere, not from Toronto. We need a regional strategy. We build spaces, but all the, all the municipalities should be doing so as well. People who need help should be helped in their communities because that's where they have the best chance of success, especially with issues of addiction and mental health. Yesterday, Jennifer Moxon was brilliant in calling it a humanitarian crisis. I'm not done. Okay, during the pandemic, Chris Moyes said, uh, the city, open hotel shelters at great cost. And even in a very short period, those places filled up. But when you look at who was occupying those spaces, it's predominantly from people from outside of Toronto. You build it and they will come. Other municipalities have to pull their way. We Torontonians do not need to be overburdened with the needs of people from other places. We can be generous, but we don't need to be heroic. It's a distraction and a misallocation of our much needed funds for climate emergency and minimizing the effects of climate change and mitigating the inevitable changes. The climate emergency and the housing emergency are real, they're now in other such emergencies FEMA comes in and the military comes in and there's an evacuation. I suggest we evacuate these people into very pleasant other circumstances, a minimum of 80 kilometers outside the border of Toronto. Toronto people do not have to be responsible. It's great that we're helpful. To put it in a tough love mode, and this may sound awful, but basically they should go back to where they came from or choose another place. My grandparents were able to find a place. Owen Sound wasn't the most comfortable place. And if, you, and if people move into these other places, we have waves of, of people in Toronto. We have waves of more immigrants on their way. Let's get ready for it. Build world-class communities somewhere else. Toronto is over full. Let's put up a sign that says, there's no more room here. Why are we trying to get more and more people into Toronto? I highly, passionately think it's important and they could have happier lives. Why be poor in Toronto when you can develop a good life somewhere else? Oh. Sorry, I tried to get this together and I'm going to continue. Um, think about shit Creek, if you will. <laughs> you had four adults living in a one bedroom motel room. They lived pretty well. If Toronto would put capital into buying up 
units in all these different resorts. You have all these different resorts, cottage dwelling mostly. They're highly under used in the winter and sometimes all year round. This would be a great investment for Toronto because if it was good an investment as these places like Friday Harbor and Innisfil say, then Toronto is in a good place to recoup on their investment down the way. But right now we need emergency shelter. So you could put a family in some of these places. They could either be charged very low rent or for the first couple of years, find ways I don't know whether things called social workers still exist, but all these things are highly doable. Think creatively, but find places to house people outside of Toronto. Cheryl, you're going to have to wrap up, please. Okay. We're enjoying you, Thank but we you. do have to wrap up. <laughs> uh, then let's... Uh... Thank you. Appreciate your, your comments tonight. <laughs> we got, I, think, I think we did. Appreciate your Thank time. You. Morris, you're doing great work. I so appreciate what you're up to. Oh, ah. you should see the smile on his face right now. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Fiza Khalid. Fiza, do we have you online with us? Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you even visual. Great. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Fiza Khalid, and I am the co-founder of a grassroots organization called Scarborough Environmental Association. Um, after reviewing this budget, I can see it does not prioritize what the city needs. Year after year, we have hundreds of people speak to council on how their place in Toronto is under threat and the conditions are becoming unsustainable. We beg for council to lend us support and make the budget make a budget for a more equitable city. We are seeing privatization of healthcare and a continuous increase of cost of living. But this budget proposes an increase in police funding while increasing transit fees and decreasing services. We need to invest in community safety solutions with an emphasis on mental health and community programs, not policing. If we continue to police out poverty while cutting funding to necessary resources such as transit, where do our priorities stand? The proposed changes in transit is a direct attack on sh attack on shift workers who were our pandemic heroes. We are also going back on our climate change goals. We will see less ridership, hence continue to see crime on transit systems as there is safety in numbers. I understand that there are a lot of issues with unhoused people using transit for warmth and an area to sleep in, but we cannot use this law and order approach when it comes to unhoused people. We have seen this approach before and we will see it fail again. People are suffering and we need to ensure to provide them with a safety net rather than spending millions to remove a few encampments for them to pop up elsewhere for the police to shut them down again. And as a woman, I tend to avoid using transit during off-peak hours if we decrease services, even with the increase of transit officers, it will not ensure the safety of myself or other transit users. Again, there is safety in numbers. Furthermore, as a transit, sorry, furthermore, as a Scarborough resident, um, I am unlikely to even go to Scarborough Town Center in the future because of the shutting down of the Scarborough RT. Cutting Transit funding will affect our city in multiple ways. And one of them is, of, of course, not meeting our climate change goals, but also people are less likely to travel to businesses and shopping centers. Not only will we be getting worse service, but we will also be paying less for, sorry, more for it. Um, if we value our city, we should view transit as an investment. Um, I would also like to compliment City Council on implementing bus lanes, especially on Eglinton. My dad is a small business owner and um, the bus lanes has helped his customer base a lot. However, I do worry with the cuts, how it will affect his businesses, his business as well as other businesses. We need to implement bus lanes throughout the city even more and using transit should not be a hindrance, but rather it should be accessible and affordable to everyone in the city. Also, I would, I would suggest um, also um, we need parking levies on commercial parking lots 
to fund transit. This has been done in other cities and city council should look into this as a revenue tool. Thank you so much for letting me speak. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you very much, Fiza. Next is uh, Zuzana Batkova. Zuzana, are you with us? Okay, Zuzana's not online at the moment. We'll come back if she comes in. Next three people are Jenny Warden, Stella Karajianakis, and Faze Jan. Welcome, Jenny. I think the red light means it's on. Yes, good evening. My name is Jenny Warden, and I am an unsuccessful candidate for City Hall, living in Ward 19, Beaches East York. And I'm here tonight on my own behalf and on behalf of the many neighbors, friends, and colleagues who share my vision for community, equity, and sustainability in Toronto, and are concerned about the grave crises facing our communities, crises in housing, community safety, climate, road safety, and all exacerbated by, the, exacerbated by the current economic situation. But before I talk about stuff in the big global way, I wanna tell you a little bit about my communities. I mentioned that I live in Ward 19, about a five minute walk from Michael Guerin Hospital. And uh, one of the lifelines in my community is a parenting group, an online parenting group, which I co-moderate. I also am very active in tenant rights advocacy. I'm a tenant. And I also find myself supporting a lot of tenants in crisis. Every week, my parenting group, this collection of mostly moms who want to provide advice about diapers and breastfeeding and formula, fields requests from desperate parents. Parents who don't have diapers, parents who can't afford formula, parents who are at risk of losing their housing. And they are coming to our group because city services are not available for them. Provincial services are not available for them. The social safety net has holes in it that are the result of over a decade of underinvestment. And so they're coming to us. I am currently supporting three families on my own as an arts worker because there is no place for people to get diapers, formula, or affordable food for their families. I have people coming to me looking for a way to get out of abusive relationships and there is no space in shelters for them. There is no space for them to go. One woman stayed with us for a period of several weeks last year and went back because she could not see a way out because of the lack of affordable housing in this city. That was what motivated me to run for City Hall, and that is why I'm here for you tonight. Because investing in policing isn't going to help my friend. She can call the police, maybe. What's that going to do? And it isn't going to help the lady who needs diapers to whom I just sent a shipment of diapers and formula. It isn't gonna help the moms in my community who are lined up for childcare. It isn't gonna help my neighbor who's been on a waiting list for childcare. It's not going to help us fast enough. And I'm sorry that you are dealing with the result of decades of underinvestment in the social safety net, but these crises are here, they are now, and they are real. So I'm here tonight to ask you to consider taking a look at that funding and allocating it to places that will really help my neighbors, the neighbors of the people who have spoken to you tonight, the neighbors of the people who deal with concerns worse than all of ours every day, to invest in community, to invest in community funding, to invest in, in community centers, in food banks, in shelters, in housing, and in all the services that help people on the regular, which is what, after all, we are all here to do. Police are not going to keep us safe. They're not going to keep my friend away from her husband. They are not going to keep the mums off the street, and they're not going to help the tenants dealing with abusive landlords who have no choice because there are no affordable apartments because the waiting list is over 10 years long for our community housing. So that's what I'm here to ask you to do tonight, is take a look at that money and reinvest, not in policing, not in the mayor's office, not in the kinds of frills that help those who already have and that are window dressing on our deep social problems that are leading to the kinds of crime that we're hearing talked about here tonight, which is actually less than, never mind, I'll go, I'll go back to my notes. 
I said a lot during my campaign that if you show me your budget, I'll show you your priorities. And my priority is seeing our friends and neighbors taken care of and seeing us support each other. And I really hope that that's where yours is too. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak and I expect better things from you. Thank you very much. Councillor Myers has a question. Hi, Jenny. Hi. Uh, hi, thank you for coming in today. Um, so you said, you know, show me your budget and show you your values. Is Pardon? Priority, sorry. It's on, you can misquote yeah. me. You got it mostly um, right. Sorry. Um, is there anything in our budget that you would like to see prioritized that you don't believe is currently being prioritized to address some of the issues that you brought up? You brought Shelter up Shelter and issues. housing. Okay. Community housing. programming, libraries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Stella Kargianakis. I believe Stella's online. Yes, I hear you. Now. Great. Welcome hello. and hello, we can hear you well. You have up to five minutes. Good. Good evening. Okay. I am a fed up taxpayer. We, we've gotten out of hand here. Toronto's property taxes are far too high, way out of the ballpark too high. <clears throat> Excuse me. Every municipality has costs relating to emergency services, community services, libraries, parks, housing, transit, whatever, snow removal, garbage collection. The costs are fairly standard across the municipality. But on the revenue side, on the revenue side, um, there are some significant differences. And the single biggest factor determining the tax rate is the number of assessed properties in the municipality which are available to share the municipal servicing costs. So if you're going to compare property taxes among municipalities, you must consider how many assessed properties there are. Assessed properties, properties that are not tax exempt, because there are a few of those too. So take Brampton as an example, because it's illustrated as a comparison in the uh, 2023 budget launch presentation, slide 48. The, um, the 2021 census data by Statistics Canada shows 189,086 private dwellings in the city of Brampton. Private dwellings pay property taxes. That's why it's significant to note private dwellings. Public housing is tax exempt. Uh, and let's put aside the other property classifications. The data for the city of Toronto, so sorry, Bra uh, Brampton, that was 189,000. The data for the city of Toronto shows 1,112,930 private dwellings. Toronto has six times more assessed dwellings, six times more properties to tax in Toronto. The average value of dwellings in the city of Brampton, according to the 2021 census, is $967,000. Average value of dwellings in Toronto, according to the 2021 census, is $1,131,000. Market values are 17% higher in Toronto. And the market value is important because it dictates the assessed value to which the tax rate is applied. So we have way more properties to tax in Toronto, and the value of the properties is higher. And every year, every year, we have tens of thousands of new dwelling units completed and assessed and added to the tax base. We have a lot of new construction, a lot of higher density, a lot of intensification, all of which translate to higher city revenues. And the budget committee and the mayor and city council are expected to understand how property tax works. The more 
the more properties there are to share in the co- in municipal costs, the lower the tax rate is, the lower the cost is for each unit. So we should be seeing a reduction in our tax rates across the board for all property classifications. And anything else is really nothing nothing less than extortion. I'm really fed up with this. Do your numbers and get it right and stop using, you know, these nonsense numbers that you've thrown into this publication. They, they're inaccurate and very misleading. And there are errors in this information that was published, the, um, the budget launch presentation, uh, specifically slides 48 and 49. Garbage collection is not included in Toronto property taxes. Um, and, and the slide says something else. And the other, the other municipalities in the GTA do include, or say they do pay uh, for garbage within their property taxes. They don't have a separate bill for garbage collection in other uh, GTA municipalities. And considering the fact that there is a proposed increase of 3% to garbage collection fees, um, I thought that was a pretty careless error to, to go in the budget document. we will have to wrap up, please. Um, second, sorry? You'll have to wrap up. You're at your five, little over five minutes. Really? I have a, over five minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So just, just to note, um, I'm just going to tell you that taxpayer that Toronto, because you've also mentioned um, income, um, the um, incomes of Toronto yeah. uh, residents, is the median income is 39000 according to stats. Thank you. Income. Thank you very the much, median, Stella. That's the median. So half, peop- half the people earn less than 30, 39000 a year. Most Stella. people in Toronto are poor. Yes. Stella, thank you very Sorry. much. No, don't worry. Okay. Don't worry. I, you you're passionate, your and I appreciate that, but it is well over the five minutes. So thank you very much for coming out to Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We're going to go back to uh, Zuzana Betkova. Just want to confirm if she is here or not. Zuzana, are you with us? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Glad you could make it. Um, you Thank have you. five minutes. Go ahead. That's great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Zuzana Vitkova. I am a midwife. Um, I work downtown Toronto, but I've lived in Scarborough and I went to school in Scarborough. So um, I feel like I know that part of the city well. And I also work across the city and I go into people's homes. I see people from many different uh, walks of life and I have... Um, and I take transit across the city, I take my car, I bike, I walk. Um, so I feel like I'm quite well acquainted um, with many of the issues that are facing Torontonians from all walks of life. Um, I, what I, I wanted to speak today um, because when I saw the budget proposal, I seriously wanted to cry. Um, I feel that the city is currently at a precipice and um, the decisions that we make today the decisions you've made at every budget have been important, but I feel this is almost like our last chance to get things right or very wrong, and I feel that we are at, on the trajectory for very, very wrong, and the implications will have disastrous um, consequences for the children growing up today, um, for senior citizens, for people who are marginalized, and even for middle-class people such as myself. Um, it is impossible for me not to notice the growing economic disparities that exist in the city. Um, I literally feel sometimes like I'm walking over bodies. It continues to baffle me why in one of the richest cities, in one of the richest countries in the world, we cannot aspire to a safer, more equitable city where people have access to safe, decent housing and where a commitment to climate justice is actually practiced in real life and not just in words. Um, while I want to speak of many things, um, I feel like a lot of people who have spoken before me have actually said a lot of the things that I want to say, and I said it much more eloquently. But I do want to implore uh, City Council to use their voices to stop the TTC counts, uh, the, sorry, the TTC cuts as a priority, 
um, and support alternative and more creative ways to get the the money that we need uh, to build this incredibly important uh, public infrastructure. Um, one of the ideas that has been circulated that I've been reading about is the idea of a commercial parking levy uh, to scale up funding for the TTC, um, as well as to fund other climate actions that are needed in the future, well, currently and in the future. Um, I feel that funding public transit is a vital part of the city's climate plan. It is crucial uh, to our economic success as a city. It is crucial to eliminate, eliminating some of the disparities that exist in the city in terms of having, people having access to getting to work on time, uh, to having employment, to having access to safe and affordable housing. These things are very much linked. This budget uh, currently is completely contrary to the city's climate action plan. Um, and my, I really don't understand why we have the money to spend on more police officers um, when we know that doesn't really help anything. They already have a billion dollars to them. Why we cannot find the creative funding programs to allow um, such as the commercial parking levy to ensure that public transit is a reliable, is reliable, clean and safe and a human right in the city. I've traveled, I've been very lucky, I've traveled quite a bit. I've lived in different parts of the world and I can tell you a lot of the world um, in countries that are much poorer than us are doing a much better job of, um, of, of public transit, of, of funding public transit, of ensuring people have access to good public transit. And this is not just, again, about um, getting from point A to A, B, from A to B in a timely and and a reliable way, which of course it is important, but also this is about climate justice, about about meeting our climate goals, um, and it's about uh, social equity as well. Um, the mayor and the council actually have the power right now to change the trajectory of the city. I am wondering, um, on an individual basis, as also as a collective, um, what you want your legacy to be. You have the choice now to make a difference. Um, in people's lives, you have a lot of power that I do not have and a lot of the other people who spoke today do not have. Um, and I really hope that you will use it uh, because this will be remembered and people will suffer or benefit based on the decisions that you make today. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking tonight. Next is Faze Jan, who's on video. Are you, you're not on the list at all? Yeah, that'd be fun. We will need your name though, for the record. Now you're speaking, you're just speaking as one? Okay. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just, if we can give you names to begin so we can Put them down for the record. So yeah, turn on, speak to the mic, into the mic. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Omar Garbie. I'm the current president of the University of Toronto Students' Union. Uh, my name is Abigail Rucker, I'm the senior executive assistant. Um, my name is Victoria Leo, I'm the vice president of public and university affairs. Thank you, just if you can just uh, after, just give clerks your, your name just for our records. Um, so we stand before you today representing 41,000 different students. Um, many of them are your constituents. All of them have a stake in the future of the city. And we're here largely because we've really, it's a, it's a pattern that we've noticed with the budget that comes forward is that oftentimes post-secondary students' voices are left out of the con uh, consultative process. And we're here to sort of prevent, uh, provide a, a, something of a corrective measure to that and help provide some insight on what students really care about and what they would like to see reflected in the priorities. Now, naturally, post-secondary students constitute a huge percentage of the population of Toronto. It's one of the largest, actually, of Canada. Um, so we think it's really incumbent upon people here to pay attention to the voices of these students, uh, especially given the stake that they'll have in the city's future. So uh, I, I would actually also like to thank um, Councilman Jamal Myers for meeting with us previously, uh, and to say that uh, though we'll be brief here, uh, everything we have is detailed much further in a document we provided, uh, and we're happy to meet with anyone in the future to go over these. Apologies. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be speaking on housing and affordability. Um, just very briefly, uh, rents have increased in the city 27%. As we all know, the 
difficulty that students have faced has been compounded by the COVID pandemic. And speaking more anecdotally, as a member of the student union, we kind of experience this lived reality in a way that a lot of other people don't. We're very proximate to it. Um, and so anecdotally, I can say that the number of students who have come to us requesting further services has increased exponentially. And we do everything that we can in our capacity as a student union to meet those needs, but we are struggling and we do request further assistance. Um, one of the identified solutions uh, is uh, ensuring that student unions and advocacy groups are included in any discussions relating to the post-secondary student housing strategy. Uh, the UTSU would be eager to facilitate or participate in these discussions, and we do think that post-secondary students are an important part of that conversation. We would also like to request that the city provide more capital to the Toronto, to the Toronto Community Housing Corporation to expand their affordable housing projects and co-op programs, investing in housing relief funds and shelters for youths suffering from homelessness, and increase financial support for municipal programs that offer grants such as the Toronto Rent Bank. Similarly, necessary, provide necessary funds to forgive any loans granted by the organization prior to April 1st, 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I'm Abigail Rucker. I'm a special, uh, sorry, I'm a senior executive assistant at uh, the UTSU. Uh, I just wanted to come here and briefly talk to you guys about transit. The University of Toronto has one of the highest uh, population of commuter, commuter students. Just have to speak into the mic, sorry. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, hi, again, my name is Abigail Rucker. I'm a senior executive assistant at the UTSU. I just wanted to come here briefly and speak to you guys today about uh, transit. The University of Toronto has about 85% uh, of our students who we consider commuter students, meaning they commute from uh, as far away as Scarborough uh, to uh, Ward 11, where uh, the university is located. Uh, it's great to get so many students from so many different parts of the area. However, with service cuts, we're looking to see that these students continue to get the kind of access to education that they deserve. Uh, a report published, again, by Students Move to Yo has found that uh, if students' commutes increase beyond two hours, there are significant impacts to uh, the level of education that they receive, their overall well-being, and especially, especially their mental health. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief because I can see the clock is going. Specifically, we are looking to see that service to uh, major uh, centers of students, you know, continues. We're looking to also hopefully get uh, a student-specific single fare developed. I know that there's already a student monthly pass. With the, inco with the oncoming uh, increases to uh, the TTC fare, we're looking to see that the price of that monthly student pass does not increase as well. Finally, uh, for the t plan 10 cent increase, we're looking to see that that does not apply to uh, the youth fair. I'll pass it off to uh, my colleague, Victoria Liu, to, uh, to conclude. And uh, thank you so much for having us here to speak today. So um, one more issue that we'd really like to raise is in regard to the 2023 budget and the increasing police budget. The UTSU is concerned that such increase might have detrimental effects on youth and students. In particular, recently, the Toronto City is involved in a lawsuit against one of the former University of Toronto students, Mr. Ogavi, who was tasered and arrested by police by being called mistakenly identified. And we have seen countless incidents of students being handcuffed and wrongly arrested, taken to mental health institutions. We'd like to stress that police are not community support workers and that we need more resources putting into nonprofit, putting into mental health services that serve the indigenous BIPOC and post-secondary students um, adequately. Uh, moreover, we would like to stress that the increase in budget and police budget is compensated by the cuts in other essential services. For example, the Toronto Employment and Social Services was cut by $400 million, $4 million, and then that is detrimental to the well-being and financial stability of students. And we thank you for engaging with the conversation with students today, and we welcome further discussions on the budget. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and appreciate you coming out tonight, thank you. Next three speakers are Akiva Chan, Omo Lee, and Adam Wettstein. Akiva Chan, are you with us? Okay, we don't have Akiva with us, so we'll go on to Omo Lee from Community Youth Outreach. Omo Lee. Oh, up there. Okay, great. Come on down. Oh, 
Welcome. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, greetings, Chambers. I thank you for extending this open invite to participation in the City of Toronto, or Scarborough. <laughs> um, if I speak under authority, I respectfully have no voice. Uh, the following deputation is being delivered, addressing working with vulnerable people in Toronto for the City of Toronto's Budget Committee meeting, January 18th, 2023. The following environments are suggested as spaces of potential value and interest that work towards creating positive impact within systems change. To note, system no longer pertains to the established policies and protocols administered by hired employees, but rather here I am using system as it pertains to the specific leadership and stewarding of lived and non-lived experiences that seek to work and earn wage and or favor within the social working services field specifically relating to the vulnerable sector on but not limited to those engaged in what, uh, mental wellness uh, and health, housing, economic engagement, academia, and identity with an emphasis on settlement in Canada. The recommendations that are suggested have not been existing, nor is it in existence, and will be addressed in detail in a supplementary document expanding on its intents and reasons deliverable tentative. It is requested that a declaration be drafted, signed, and minted from and by the City of Toronto and its distinguished municipal representatives to stand and act against the removal, discharge, and or restriction of Indigenous First Nations and their genetically affirmed lineages from receiving self-requested servicing space and or support from the vulnerable sector unless otherwise instructed by the identified individuals of that municipal. Number two, that an established, that there be established a woman-led, women's only, client-sensitive training center for applicable policy change leading to the enforcement of women's only staffing, giving priority to Indigenous-led staffing agencies and underrepresented minor, minority female and women identi identified peoples and or groups as it pertains to the treatment, administration of care, and relative servicing of victims of gender-based violence, sexual violence, sex trafficking, and or otherwise deemed by the victim as pro-predatorial engagement, servicing, and social associative discourse for an elimination of harmful and or targeted neglect, abandonment, administered through and by larger entities claiming to service women and women's only space with a with and under anti-oppressive trauma-informed, client-centered and harm reduction models of service. Um, according to the city's tabled 2023 budget, they will aim to improve and protect and preserve frontline city services. Uh, another recommendation is that they establish a client-sensitive model for the budgeting of a 24-hour accessible advocacy center likened to be used as uh, centers for unsafe, under, resource, unemployed, and or precariously housed Canadian citizens and their presumed legal associates. The 2023 budget states that it will invest in emergency services and public safety with an investment of 35 million in the emergency medical dispatch and preliminary care sector. Uh, it is suggested that they establish a client-sensitive model for the budgeting of a 24-hour crisis center. This is not a uh, part of the hospitals or the emergency centers, but a, a designated uh, crisis center, 24-hour crisis center for mental health and wellness, addressing the need for alternative <laughs> accessible and affordable solutions for common public mental health states, including but not limited to anxiety, PTSD, anger management, grievance, depression, etc., with a emphasis on developing female and male specific environments as well as co-ed inclusive spaces that acknowledge and minister and partner with and through the Ministry of Public Health with a Focus on community-led 
support initiatives, and <coughs> consultations addressing healing, coping, and validation services. We'll have to wrap up, please. Programs emphasizing both attractive, truthful, widely respected, and publicly accessible information. It is also asked that that they establish a budget to assume accountability in the societal inequity resulting in the deaths and terror of two-spirit LGBTQ members. Such accountability would work to fashion itself into a two-spirit LGBTQ plus friendly uh, community center for the support and so socioeconomic empowerment of self-identified members and allied non-threatening citizens with an emphasis my apologies. <laughs> you, you will have to wrap up. We're already mm -hmm. way beyond five minutes. With an emphasis on eradicating the city-led gatekeeping of information, archive, and do documentation and political representation for youth and stagnated uh, representatives resulting in a progressive movement towards a more internationally inclusive, trauma-informed, Call political. Thank you very much. Sorry, my apologies. That's okay. Environment for both public and private spectators, affiliate staffing, and program participants. Thank you. We'll have to go to the next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can actually send that in to us as well for our, our review if you wish, if you want to email it in. BUC at Toronto.ca. Okay, and who would I be addressing this to? To the budget committee at BUC at but Toronto. Who would, who, would be, who would I be? Just the budget committee. It just to? the budget committee. Our clerks will get it, then it'll, it'll be uh, put part of our record to review. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Adam Wettstein. Hey, Adam. Worship counselors, thank you for putting in this very warm room all your time. Um, I'm here to talk about, I'm gonna find you $100 million. We're all ears. Yeah. I live in Willowdale. I want you to stop Transform Young. It was a project that is budgeted for $65 million. It's not wanted. First it was put in by Jennifer Kesmet, and she lost. Then it was put in by, Mark, by Marcus O'Brien, uh, Marcus O'Brien in the last election, and he lost. <laughs> they don't need a bike lane on Young Street. I'm with all the uh, with all the condominium boards. They don't want it. <laughs> and to have a program that basically serves one percent of the entire population, so that th they can make traffic worse. I mean, it's bad enough downtown. You have to take the bike lanes off Simcoe Street, make it two ways. That would solve half of the cons. Anyways, that's another issue. Anyways, so put the bike lane up my street, which is Beecroft, which is one street over. You'll have your bike lane. You won't have the f fights, and it won't cost you 60 million. Well, it's 60 million in the budget right now, but we really know it'll be 100 million by time it goes. So please reopen it and vote it out. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Oh, hold on, Councillor Thompson has a question. Yeah, so thank you very much um, for being here, uh, sir. Um, so you've consulted with um, residents and businesses along Young Street? All the boards of the condos. Right. Which is 30,000 and people, yeah. And, and there were, we actually had the meeting five years ago and everyone didn't want it and everyone said no put it on Beecroft and somehow it magically got back onto Young Street right because uh, it, it was a vanity project for for John Fillion I mean that's that was it and I, I will say that now I mean I like the man but this was his thing we don't and it go back uh, when we and we don't need to do it because we need to water main because the water main is already was put in for two years ago so that's done and the hydro has been put in last year so all they need to do is pave over the road now. The businesses, all the businesses up Young Street have these signs. No bike lanes on Young Street. It's like you can see them. You can drive by them. They're there. And, um, and it doesn't make it any more dangerous. I mean, in fact, 
in the suburbs if we should do what Montreal does and allows people in the suburbs to ride their bikes on the sidewalks because there's no people on the sidewalks in North York. <laughs> and, okay, thank yeah, you very much. Thank sir. you. Thank you for coming out. Next uh, speaker is Kamoya Ranger. Kamoya, I believe, is online, I think. Oh, okay. So there's no Kamoya. Is Kamoya here? No. Okay, we will come back to her. Tasnia Hussain is online. Welcome, Tasnia. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you clearly. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Tasnia, and I've lived in Ward 23 for almost 20 years. Uh, I have three major points to make. The first is that I'm an economics PhD candidate at U of T, and what stands out to me when assessing the city's proposed budget is that in the city's cost-benefit analysis, it mainly is responding to the rising cost of providing services because of borrowing costs. Uh, so transit, for example, has reduced largely because of that reasoning. What is clear from the funding choices is that the benefits of social services have been underweighted. What I want to ask is how, if at all, the committee has considered the positive externalities of the services it has cut. For example, one of the main benefits from public transit is reduced air pollution. And in 2017, the city had a report on traffic pollution that showed that contaminants along our major highways, like benzene in particulate matter, things that can cause lung cancer and asthma, is sometimes higher than health guidelines. The report also concludes that healthcare costs from traffic related air pollution comes up to about $10 billion. A paper published this year also found that for highly polluted cities, and they look at around 60 cities, they find that a subway system provides almost $1 billion in savings every single year from reduced mortality. So by not considering the positive externalities, the budget doesn't show foresight and it betrays a limited understanding of the economics of self -so social services. Secondly, it also shows that the budget perpetuates existing inequality. When you shut down line three, and cut off your entire East End from accessing services, education, and professional jobs that are downtown, you leave us behind. And I've spent the last six years taking the RT. I spent three hours commuting already. And one solution that I'm shocked wasn't considered is just implementing designated times for when the RT is open, uh, such as during peak hours, which I think for some bus routes that was taken into consideration, but it seems it wasn't even proposed for the RT. By making the TTC less attractive to use, you create a negative feedback loop where ridership falls even lower because we're hitting up to 10 minute wait times for subways. The budget paves the way for transit to deteriorate over time because every year you'll see less ridership due to service cuts. You'll have more funding issues and then be required to make even more cuts that reduce ridership again. The last point I wanna make is that I understand that there are funding issues but the choice of where funding is now directed shows that the city's priorities are not aligned with ours. Half of the road maintenance budget goes towards the gardener. The gross budget for Tory's office rose by 40%, with spending on the police budget up by $50 million, despite extensive academic research that shows that more police does not mean safer communities. Multiple community members have met with you today to tell you this. So I'm left wondering which pockets of Toronto were consulted with when it was decided to increase the police budget. That sums up all of the points that I wanna make. Uh, many of us have doubts as to whether the things we're proposing now can be implemented in such a short time. At best, we're hoping that they're implemented next year, but I hope that this committee can take into account the public's feedback from today's session and from yesterday's session and adjust the budget accordingly sooner rather than later. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, members, we have two more registered speakers. Uh, the first one is Patience Evbaggara, and the last one is Tina Volpe. Patience, are you with us? Oh, there we are. Great. Good evening. 
Um, I just want to make this really quick. I'll make it as quick as possible in that five minutes. I grew up in a fantastic neighborhood here in Scarborough. You know, I went to a fantastic elementary school. My community was great. Going to high school now was a little bit different. I went to a high school that was, you know, sort of in a neighborhood that my parents were a little bit concerned about. They said, out of all the high schools that you could pick, why are you going to this school? I had my reasons. Um, I want to describe myself as a well-traveled person. I of course, apart from being born in Quebec and living in Quebec for some time, I've lived in London, England, I've lived in Jamaica, I've lived in Nigeria, I've lived in Kenya for quite some time. Um, with that being said, I have friends who are literally uh, successful entrepreneurs, friends who are literal millionaires, I have friends who are diplomats around the world, um, and I also have friends that I knew in high school from that area that are in jail, not to mention the friends that I know that are dead from that same area. I hope that in any of my friend groups that I've mentioned, there's two specific groups that stand out to you, the ones that are in jail and the ones that are dead from Scarborough. Question I, us I usually ask myself is, what, what was different for them? Why are they different? What's dif what makes me different from them and the, people that I, the rest of the successful people that I know? Well, let's just say this. They grew up in a resourceful country, but a poor city. Not a poor in terms of finances, but poor in terms of community planning and safety. What's changed? From gun violence to carjacking, drug trafficking, and the unimaginable, these are caused by youth. When you look at the statistics, majority youth. There's an African proverb that says, to know where you're going to, you must have an idea of where you came from. Many at-risk neighborhoods in Toronto are not equipped with proper community planning that can make it motivating or inspiring to even relate or connect back to where you are from. The future of the city of Toronto is questionable when youth and their upbringing are neglected. The youth are the future and the future is now, one of my famous slogans that I love to say on repeat. I also work with Tropicana and I work with a lot of at-risk youth, just providing them jobs and ensuring that we can get them equipped for success. And when I do one-on-ones with a lot of the intakes that I have with these youth, oh man, you hear the backgrounds, you hear the, the barriers. That's one of the questions that we ask them when we're doing intakes. What are some barriers for you? If you hear some of these barriers, it's rooted back into community. This budget seems to invest more in policing, in my opinion, than in community planning. I'm not going to repeat a lot of the things that people have said because I've been watching the budget um, deputations even at City Hall. And I can tell you one thing. A lot of people are saying the same thing when it comes to uh, navigating how we're going to take on gun violence and the different crimes that are happening in the city of Toronto caused by um, these youth. Well, I can tell you one thing. Um, it's all about approach. I think that many people have been talking about hubs. And we hear that often. I've been talking about that since, oh goodness, I can't remember how long. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Thompson, I'm sure you're familiar. I've been seeing that for quite some time. But one thing I want to change up about what I've been saying in the past is we need specific, unique programs, specific, unique hubs, not just hubs that some youth are first and foremost embarrassed to go to or can sit back on their friends while their friends are doing other things saying, what am I doing here? We need hubs that cater to the youth, cater to the, 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 the likes of the, of the youth and what they do. I wanna give a shout out to Gallery 223, Lead to Change Foundation, P2P Foundation. These are organizations within the city of Toronto that have created spaces for youth to come in, learn how to make clothes, learn how to be a sound engineer, learn how to do all these unique things that a lot of programs do not really amplify. I believe that the money indeed can be spent better elsewhere. As I mentioned again, unique social programs. Let this budget not rob communities of needed support services and infrastructure improvements. I think that a lot of logical thinkers, of course, on a regular day would have no issue when it comes to setting up a budget for you know, the police and making sure that we're protected in this country in a sense, right? However, it becomes questionable when we know what is going on in our city, we know how violence, we know how crime is taking, is like a pandemic for youth. Youth are dying every, no, not I'm gonna say every day, but youth are dying at, at, you know, at a pace that's just like we can prevent it. So I urge city council to really brainstorm after this, brainstorm about how this money is being effectively spent. And when we think about hubs, when we think about community spaces for these youth, let's think about the best, the best way that we can make Toronto a model city for the rest of the world and for the rest of global cities around the world. We don't need to copy any other city. The city of Toronto is one of the most diverse cities and one of the most promising cities in Canada in North America and in the rest of the world. And I believe that we can do better. I think that $48 million, goodness. <laughs> 
$48 million, and then you look at the budget that we have for youth and community planning, it's really one of those situations where I think I should say less because I think a lot of people have said a lot. But I'm going to ask one thing. We need to invest in Toronto's youth minds because Toronto's youth minds and the infrastructure of Toronto is crumbling. In this budget, let us make Toronto great. Let us make Toronto a model city. And we can only do that by being real with ourselves, truthful with the community, and ensuring that we're empowering a future for the youth that is the leaders of tomorrow for success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming up. Thank you. Next is Tina Volpe. We don't see Tina online. She's not here. Okay. That just, is Kamoya Ranger here? I just want to go through the names that... Akiva Chan. And the last one is Victoria Bisback from earlier on. Just want to... Okay. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming out. We do have a motion, a technical motion. Budget Committee received the public presentations on the 2023 capital and operating budgets for information. All in favor? Opposed? That's great. I want to thank everybody for coming out for the public presentations as part of the budget process. And, of course, thank my, my colleagues for coming out and the mayor. And I want to thank uh, our clerk staff, who did an incredible job over the last two days for us. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. A lot of behind-the-scenes work happens to make these uh, a success. Thank you for coming out.